spouses and the seven grandkids with us for a couple of weeks, and it was a great time. We had just moved from one house to another, and so they were coming to check out where mom and dad were living and if it was a good place to come visit. And um, during their stay, my daughter and I had several times where we were alone, and my daughter uh, likes to ask hard questions. I don't know where she got that. But anyway, <clears throat> she said, Mom, she said, uh, what women are you hanging out with these days? And uh, that opened up a dialogue with her, and I began to share with my daughter Cindy how I was valuing more and more the time that I could spend with my two mentors who are now 72 and 82. And um, I told her that it all of a sudden had struck me, one of them is not in that great of health, but it struck me that they're getting older and they could leave this life soon. And so I wanted to be with them and I wanted to glean from them at every opportunity that I could. When these two ladies pass on, I will miss them greatly. I have learned much from these two special women in my life, and they are indeed two of my spiritual mothers. Now, you might ask, well, what does this have to do with 1 Timothy? Well, as we begin our study in 1 Timothy, this is somewhere where we find the Apostle Paul and his son in the faith, Timothy. Uh, Paul just has a few years left to live, and he has some things that he wants to say to his son, Timothy, whom he has mentored. Now, I don't know if either one of my mentors are going to write me a letter before they die and leave it to me, but um, I know one of my mentors, she writes a, a letter every year to her son that she puts in a big shoebox, and when she dies, he's going to get all those letters. So that's kind of cool, but um, I would value that if either one of them wanted to write me a letter that they would leave. Um, before they passed on. But anyway, I thought that was kind of neat. Now, before we begin this wonderful letter from a spiritual father to a spiritual son, I want to go over just a little bit of background of this epistle so that we might better understand it as we study it. First Timothy, as you probably know, is one of three epistles that are called the pastoral epistles. I was talking to my son this evening before we left. He's here helping me nurse his father and and we were talking about the pastoral epistles and how precious they are. And there are three of them, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And all of these are written by Paul to his two spiritual sons, 1 and 2 Timothy to Timothy and Titus to Titus. And he calls both of these men his sons in the faith. And so both Timothy and Titus were discipled by the apostle Paul. Now, these three epistles, for those of you that have been in our other studies, you've been here for Philippians and Colossians and some of the other epistles that Paul's written, you're going to see a little bit different tone in a pastoral epistle because it has a very personal note uh, due to the fact that it's written from a father to a son. And uh, Paul and Timothy were dear friends, and so you will see that. And hopefully you'll see that as we go through 1 Timothy. I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing a ladies' conference, and before I got up, I did four sessions. And before I got up for each session, one of the young ladies who was leading us in worship, she quoted from memory uh, first Tim uh, 2 Timothy. She did chapter 1, and then chapter 2, and then chapter 3, and chapter 4. And it was one of the most moving scripture quotations uh, I have ever, recitations that I have ever witnessed. Debbie's back there shaking her head, yes. It almost brought tears to me because it, it was just like I could feel the Apostle Paul as she was pouring out her heart as she was quoting 2 Timothy. And so hopefully you will see that, that they are very, very personal. These three epistles are also very practical, even though they do deal with doctrinal issues. So let's go with, over a little bit of background material. First question that comes to my mind when I'm studying a book is, who wrote this book? Well, just look at the first word and you can see who wrote the book, right? Paul. Paul, an apostle. We'll go into that in just a little bit about more about who he is. Um, secondly, when I'm looking at a book, I want to know who it's written to. And you don't have to go very far to find out who it's written to. Look at verse 2. To Timothy, my own son in the faith. Now, even though this epistle is written to Timothy, it is also written to the church at Ephesus. 
And the reason we know that, because Paul tells Timothy, I want you to stay here at Ephesus. There were some false teachers that were infiltrating the church. Some had even defected from the faith. We're going to talk about Hymenaeus and Alexander when we get to the end of chapter 1. They, they defected from the faith. And Paul said uh, to Timothy, I've got to go into Macedonia, but you stay here in Ephesus. Uh, there's some work that has to be done. And the reason we know that it's not just written to Timothy, because when you come to the end of 1 Timothy, Paul's very last words are, grace be with you. And the you there is in the plural in the Greek. And so it's not just written to Timothy, it is also written to the church at Ephesus. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now another question you might have is, where was Paul when he wrote this epistle? Where was he? Well, he wasn't in prison. Usually he's always in prison writing epistles. And aren't we glad for that? I think the, the Pauline epistles from prison are just very, very special. But he's not in prison. It appears he's in Macedonia, and we know that from verse 3. He says, I'm beseeching you to stay at Ephesus while I go into Macedonia. And so 1 Timothy was written uh, from Macedonia. We know that 2 Timothy was written from prison actually one year before Paul was beheaded by Nero. And the reason we know that, because in 2 Timothy, Paul says, For I am now ready uh, to, be, to depart. The time, my time is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And uh, by the way, if I die before you die, that's what I want written on my tombstone. Is I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. But I have it written down in my planner. I know I'm archaic. I still keep a planner. So um, I have that written down. That's the verse that I want on my tombstone. If I have kept the faith. Now, if I have apostrophe, size from the faith. I'll put that on my tombstone. But I'm trusting that I am going to stay firm to the end. Now, another question we might want to know when, when we're looking at a book of the Bible is when was it written? When was this epistle written? The probable date for this epistle was between 62 and 66 AD. There's not a lot of certainty exactly, um, but it's just a few years before Paul is beheaded. Paul was beheaded in 68 AD, and 2 Timothy was written in 67 AD, so it's just a few years before his death. Now, one of the questions that I also am eager to discover is why. You know, I like to ask lots of questions, and one of them is why. Why was this letter written? Why was this epistle written? Well, as I mentioned earlier, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are known as the pastoral epistles. And so one of the reasons that they are referred to being the pastoral epistles, and one of the reasons Paul writes to Timothy and Titus, is so that they would remember their responsibilities as pastors. And ladies, one of those responsibilities, and we don't see much of this in our churches today, is defending the truth. We live in a watered-down society, and our churches are going amok, and uh, pastors are not defending the truth. And yet Paul writes to these two men about the importance of defending the truth and confronting false teachers, very practical instructions on church, how it should be conducted, the role of men and women. There's a lot in 1 Timothy about women, and uh, I probably will get in trouble before this uh, before our study is over, and that's okay. Um, but there's a lot written on the role of the woman and how she should behave herself in the house of God. Now, this certainly is not an exhaustive list, but these things are very common in the pastoral epistles, um, particularly here in 1 Timothy, because Paul tells him to stay there in Ephesus while he goes into Macedonia, and he says, I want you, I'm charging you that you teach them that they teach no other doctrine. And so there was false doctrine that was infiltrating the church there at Ephesus. And interesting enough, he says the same thing to Titus. First thing he says is he writes Titus, he says, I want you to appoint elders in every city. And he said the reason is there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, and they're, they're subverting whole households. They're turning upside down whole households with their false teaching. And Paul tells Titus, he says, you rebuke them, and you rebuke them sharply. And so um, he is giving instructions to both of these men. Now, ladies, this is certainly one of the main roles of any pastor of any true church. Listen very carefully, because not all of you go to Grace Community Church. True shepherds will protect 
their flocks from false teachers. They will protect them. That's part of their job. And they will be willing to stand for truth and confront anyone who's teaching any other thing but sound doctrine. And I'm thankful for a husband who does that and is not afraid to do that. And uh, he is a good shepherd, even though right now he's in a lot of pain. He is a good shepherd. Now, this was not the only reason that Paul wrote 1 Timothy, because he mentions in chapter 3, if you want to turn over there, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, we're still asking why he wrote this. He says, I'm writing these things to you, Timothy, and I'm hoping to come to you quickly. I'm hoping to come to you shortly. But if I can, if I have to tarry long, that you may know how you should behave yourself in the house of God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. And so here is another reason why Paul is writing this pastoral epistle is so that they would know Timothy could instruct on how to behave ourselves in the house of God. And so as we study 1 Timothy, we're going to see that Paul instructs Timothy and the church not only regarding sound doctrine, but he's also going to give instruction regarding the use of the law, uh, the role of women in the church, the qualifications for leadership, and by the way, I wish our churches today would uh, screen their elders and their deacons uh, based on these qualifications, and if they're not qualified, they should not be put into that office. Um, we're also going to be looking at that mysterious passage, Doctrines of Demons. And by the way, they have crept into our churches today, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from certain food, which God has been created to be received with thanksgiving. And so we're going to look at the doctrines of demons that have kept, crept into our church. Uh, we're going to look at the importance of spiritual gifts, um, how to rebuke older women and men, uh, qualifications for a widow, the importance of being content with food and clothing alone, the, warn, the warning of loving money along with a warning for those who are rich. Paul also writes uh, several times in 1 Timothy regarding the depth of his own sin. He, Paul sees himself as the chief of sinners and he's humbled that God would allow him to serve him. And so you're going to see uh, several doxologies in 1 Timothy, and they are beautiful um, that he writes. One man writes this. He says, let me alert you to a theme that runs throughout as we begin to look at this pastoral epistle. What is necessary to carry on a fruitful, faithful ministry of the word is healthy teaching given by trustworthy persons. That's a great quote, end of quote. Ladies, this is a very rich yet warm letter that should challenge all of us. And so with that in mind, there's a lot more background material I could have given you. Uh, somebody asked some questions at our table this evening. Uh, when did Timothy die and how did he die? Well, those are some things that uh, hopefully you can study on your own. There's always a lot. We can take actually five or six lessons and probably even more to give a lot of background ground material. But I'm eager to get into the first two verses this evening. And so I want to read those to you, and then I will give you an outline, and we will cover, Lord willing, these first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our outline tonight is threefold. Um, the title of this lesson is The Beginning of a Letter from a Father to a Son. The Beginning of a Letter from a Father to a Son. The outline is threefold, as I said. Number one, who is the Father and what is He known for? Who is the Father and what is He known for? That's a small f, by the way. That's found in verse one. Who is the Son and what is He known for? And that's a little less. Who is the Son and what is He known for? Verse two. And then thirdly, who is our Father, capital F, who is our Father, and what is He known for? And we'll see that in both verses, 1 and 2. So let's look first of all at who is the Father and what is He known for. Paul begins by saying, Paul. <clears throat> Paul. He begins with his name. And ladies, we've, for those of you that have been in our studies, you know this is very common. That's how James begins his epistle, James. Uh, the New Testament writers would start their letters and they would begin with their name. Um, and I like that. 
you know, um, usually when you get a letter or email or something, you have to, well now emails, you have who it is at the top, but old, the old fashioned way, you know, when you used to write a letter and sign your name at the, at the bottom, you had to look at the bottom of the letter to see who it was from. But um, anyway, the New Testament writers did not do things that way. They put their name first. And you know, progress does not always mean the best, right? In fact, uh, recently I've been struck with that. I got a new computer, I got a new phone, and you know, they're always doing these automatic updates. And I'm like, why do you have to do that? I, I like the old better. And then I can't figure out how to use the computer. And I can't figure out how to use the phone. Or, you know, you used to be able just to call somebody, you know, call the doctor's office and actually talk to somebody. And now, you know, press one if you're this, press two if you're this, press three if you're this. And I just want to talk to a person. And so uh, progress does not always mean it is the best way. But I think the New Testament writers had it great and so we've kind of degressed not progress so if you want to write to me and put put uh, your name first you know if you want to so anyway Paul begins by mentioning his name so who is Paul who is the Apostle Paul well we know his name means little one we know from church history he was short in stature along with being bald and also his eyebrows were thick and bushy, in fact, he probably need to pluck them. They uh, actually grew together. They were just kind of like one big eyebrow. And uh, my husband's always saying, reminds him of Jonathan Chattel, you know, just that one big eyebrow. So he wasn't that great to look at. I mean, can you picture that? Someone bald, one big eyebrow, and short. And probably he was a little chubby too. But you know, Paul, I'm not gossiping about him because he says that about himself. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10:10. 10, 10, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and contemptible. So even Paul says, you know, I'm not that great to look at. So, uh, but you know what, isn't that great? God can use any of us, even if we're short and fat and bald and have one eyebrow. <laughs> we know from Acts 9 that God saved him on the Damascus road to preach the gospel and to suffer for Christ's sake. And you know, Paul's life was never the same. If you read any of Paul's letters, and I hope you do, I hope you're systematically always reading the Word of God, but if you really read Paul's letters and his epistles, you will see that this is a man who is humble. He never got over the fact that God saved him. He never got over it. In fact, he refers to himself often as the chief of sinners, the least of the apostles, the Apostle Paul was a very humble man, and he knew that it was only because of God's grace that he could do anything. Ladies, that's where you and I need to be. We need to be right there with him. Well, after he mentions his name, he reminds them who he is, and notice what he says. He says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God. Now, we have had this word before, apostle, so I'm not going to take much time to, to explain it, but the Greek word is apostolos. Apostolos, which means to be sent on a mission with a message. That's what an apostle was. They were sent on a mission with a message. And if you have read Paul's conversion in Acts 9, you know what that mission was. Jesus said, I want you to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. And guess what else I want you to do, Paul? I want you to suffer for me. Now, ladies, when you when God called and saved you, you know, how would you like for him to tell you that? Sharon, I'm gonna, you know, I want you to do this and I want you to do this and I want you to uh, you know do this in the women's ministries, and I want you to suffer, Sharon. I want you to suffer. That's that's quite a mission, isn't it? And so Paul knew that going into it, that it, the road would not be easy for him. Now, Paul makes it very clear, notice, that his apostleship was not from him, but notice who it's from. Jesus Christ, and it was a commandment of God our Savior. Now, it, again, if you read Paul's letters, the word commandment, that's different. Do you know what Paul usually says? I'm an apostle by the will of God. He doesn't usually say commandment. Interesting. Now, you might say, well, why does he use commandment here? Why does he say, I'm an apostle by the commandment of God? Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. But the word commandment, very interesting. It has the idea of a command given by someone who was a king, as in the case of Esther. Remember in the story of Esther, 
King Ahasuerus, remember in chapter one, he told Queen Vashti, he said, I want you to come in. You're beautiful to look upon, and I want you to come in, and I want you to parade before everybody, and I want them to look at your beauty. And remember, she refused, and she lost her queenship over that. And there was a lot of debate. Was, was he asking her to, you know, stroll around naked? Was What was it? Why did she refuse? And we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But the, the point is, ladies, that this was a commandment given by a king, and you didn't disobey you did not disobey the king. It was a commandment, and it was to be followed. And so it's the same Greek word. And Paul says, I'm an apostle by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, why is he using that here in 1 Timothy? Why is it different than the other epistles? Well, two reasons, I think. Number one, remember it's the end of his life, okay? He's coming to the end of his life. And sometimes when we get to the end of our life, we kind of get soft. You know, and we kind of become stagnant in our walk. In fact, that's another question Cindy and I talked about. Mom, she goes, how do you confront old women and old men who don't want to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ? And Paul's going to talk about that in chapter 5, how to confront older men and women. But uh, I said, Cindy, that's a good question. You know, I, I, don't, I, you know I, I don't have a problem with that, but I said, I have a problem with how come men and women who really love the Lord Jesus Christ don't get stronger and stronger in their walk with Christ. Um, and so she was talking to me about that as too. But anyway, Paul, he's coming to the end of his life. He's getting older, and he knows he's going to die soon. And yet he still remembers that he is to receive orders from somebody else other than himself, even though he's coming to the end of his life. The Lord Jesus Christ is still his Lord and his Master. Now, secondly, the second reason I think Paul says commandment here. Even though Paul and Timothy had a very close relationship, even though Timothy would understand that Paul was commanded by God to be an apostle, remember this epistle is also written to the church at Ephesus. And false teachers were infiltrating the church. And so the church at Ephesus needed to be reminded that Paul is an apostle by the command of God. This will give weight as he writes. In fact, he's going to write very quick about Hymenaeus and Alexander who defected from the faith. And we're going to talk about them a little bit later on in chapter 1. And so this is going to give weight to what he writes, especially regarding false teachers. And so, ladies, if you knew that, um, you know, Paul was writing a letter to your church and he was an apostle and it was by the command of God. It was to be followed no matter what. And all of a sudden he starts writing to Grace Community Church about things going on. I think we take wake up and listen, right? This is Paul. He's an apostle. He's commanded by God. And I will listen to what this man has to say. And so that is very possible another reason why he uses the word command. Now maybe you're thinking, well, you know, Susan, I think that's kind of mean of the Lord. I mean, that's kind of mean of the Lord to command Paul to be an apostle? Not really. Ladies, when we grasp the truth that God is ruler over our life, then you know what? We submit joyfully to his lordship, right? We should submit joyfully to his lordship. And as John says, there's no command that he gives that's a burden, right? His commands are not burdensome. They're not irksome. Because we want to joyfully follow the one who saved us. Also, thinking still on this line, you might be saying it's kind of mean for God to command him to be apostle. When you consider... The character of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul mentions next, then why would any of his commands be harsh? Notice what Paul says. He says he is our hope. He is our hope. This commandment given to Paul by God was the God who is our hope. Why would we not submit to someone like that who is our hope? In fact, the word hope has the idea of Christ being our very substance, our foundation, the object of our hope. Ladies, this is a certainty Paul is referring to. It's not a I hope so. You know, you might say, you know, I, I hope to I hope Susan really lets us out at eight o'clock tonight. Or, you know, I hope ISIS doesn't come to the United States of America and behead all of us. Or I hope to get married someday, or I hope to have children someday. Those are hopes. Those aren't anything we can bank on, right? Those are not certainties. 
But ladies, Christ, our hope, is a certainty that we can count on for sure, right? He is our hope, and we can count on him for sure. Is he your hope? What is your hope? What do you hope for? Who do you hope for? Is your hope in your marriage? A child? A person? Your financial future? Ladies, our hope should be in the Lord, and he is enough. And Paul knew that. And so he said, this is a commandment. I am commanded by God to be an apostle. And you know what? This very same God is our hope. He is my hope. So, what is Paul, the spiritual father of Timothy, known for from this verse? He is known as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who is our heavenly father? And what is he known for from this verse? He is God, our Savior, and he is our only well, Paul then writes next to give us a little glimpse into the character of his son in the faith, Timothy, along with the greeting. Notice what he says. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Paul mentions who he's writing to, and his name is Timothy. Who is Timothy? Well, according to Acts 16, and you saw this in your homework, Paul met Timothy when he came to Derby and Lystra. Remember, a, a certain disciple was there who, who, uh, who his mother was a Jewish but believed and his father was a Greek, and Timothy well was, re, was well reported of by the brethren that were in Lystra and Iconium. And remember, Paul wanted to take him with him, but he had to get him circumcised first because of the Jews that were in those quarters, and so they wouldn't respect anything Timothy said. In fact, one of the questions in our group tonight was, how'd they do that? How'd they know that? How'd they know he wasn't circumcised? And uh, I won't tell you what else was said. But anyway, so uh, Paul went and had him circumcised before he took him on his missionary journey with him. We also know that he had a mother, Eunice, and a grandmother, Lois. And they must have taught him the word of God because Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.5, I call to remember the genuine faith that is in you that first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Lewis. Uh, Lewis your mother Eunice. Also from 2 Timothy 3.15, remember Paul says, from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And so evidently even though Timothy's father was not a believer, he was not a Christian, his mother and his grandmother were believers. And I want to just stop and say this should be encouraging to you ladies who are trying to to raise your children without a godly father. This should be encouraging to you because who knows, you too might be raising a Timothy. And it also should be encouraging to know that even though your children may not have a godly father, that there are a lot of Pauls out there. There are a lot of godly older men. In fact, we've had two young men just recently come to our church in the last seven months, and somebody was asking, what are they doing here? Why are they here? And they said, because we like the older men here. And so you just never know that God would raise up somebody to be a father for your children, even though they might not have a spiritual father. And so I think that is very encouraging, that even though Timothy didn't have a believing father, he had Paul the Apostle Paul. Oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's like two or three fathers. Now, we do not know how Timothy got converted. Like the Apostle Paul, we know he was saved on the Damascus Road. We don't have a record of Timothy's conversion. We can speculate. Maybe Paul had something to do with it. But I think probably more the influence of his grandmother and his mother. Uh, somehow they impressed the gospel upon his soul. It is interesting Paul mentions Timothy in every one of his letters except Galatians, Ephesians, and Titus. Those are the only three. So, I mean, these guys were together all the time. And uh, I have not given you a list of exhaustive facts. That's why I gave you all those verses. And I know some of you were groaning when you saw all those verses you had to look up. But actually, that was my favorite question this week because I really enjoyed uh, getting to know more about Timothy. And I hope you gleaned a lot from that question. But here, Paul, in this text, he gives us a small glimpse into who he is. He calls him a true son in the faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, true would be in the sense of not being false. In fact, the word true in biblical times often referred to children who were born in wedlock compared to children who were not true that were born out 
of wedlock. They were called illegitimate. Um, in fact, it's like the writer to the Hebrews says, you know, it mentions about those whom God chastens, those he loves, he chastens. He scourges every son whom he receives. And then Paul goes on to say, if you're not whipped by the Lord, if you're not chastened by the Lord, you're illegitimate. You're not a son. You're not a true son. And so Paul says about Timothy, he is true. He is a true son. He was genuine. He, he is not like Hymenaeus and Alexander that we're going to learn about in a couple of weeks who defected from the faith. And maybe that's why Paul emphasizes this fact at the very beginning as he's writing this, this letter to the church at Ephesus. He wants the church at Ephesus to know even though Hymenaeus and Alexander defected from the faith, Timothy's not like that. He is not illegitimate. He is a true son in the faith. Well, Paul mentions not only that he's a son, but a true son. Uh, he was not a son in the flesh, but he was a son in the faith. And I don't know about you, but for me, spiritual family, many times and most times, is far more precious than physical family. I happen to have one daughter. Uh, she's a believer, so she's not only my physical daughter, but she is also my daughter in the faith. But I have a lot of spiritual daughters, and um, I am blessed to have had these kind of relationships that stimulate me to love and to good deeds. And I was telling my table tonight that I learn from them more than I think I give to them. I glean a lot from spending time with them. But Timothy was not his son in the flesh, but he was his son in the faith. Now, Timothy's not the only one that Paul calls his true son in the faith. He calls Titus the same thing. We won't look there, but in Titus 1.4, he also calls him his true son in the faith. And by the way, since we're talking about uh, Paul and Timothy, you might wonder how these men, you know, what did Paul do? I mean, this, the discipling and the fact that he could call them his true sons in the faith. Ladies, discipleship in biblical times was very different than our modern-day discipling. I know a lot of you have discipling relationships, but it wasn't anything like biblical discipleship. Um, in discipleship, in New Testament times, it was very, very serious business. In fact, when Jesus says in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission that they were to go and make disciples, the Greek word for disciple there is mathetes, and it has the idea of a person attaching themselves to another per person for the purpose of growing into Christ's likeness. And so when someone would be discipled in the New Testament, the master, in this case being Paul, and the mentors being Timothy and Titus, uh, Paul would have a set plan for them. They were to obey what Paul said. Um, they learned a lot by uh, scripture memorization. A lot of it was memorization, oral teaching, questions and answered. Um, but that's what discipleship was. It's a very serious business. You obeyed what your master said. And so it's quite different from our modern day discipleship where we go to Starbucks and we chit chat, talk about the weather and what verse we memorized that week and, you know, how's your week? It's very, very different. This was serious stuff. And so when you think about biblical discipleship, you can see how Paul would entrust these men to pastor all the churches he started, right? Because Titus and Timothy were serious. They were serious about their walk with Christ. And so whatever Paul said, do, they did. If he said memorize Romans, they did it. If they said memorize Leviticus, they did it. And uh, you're like, say what? So uh, it was very, very serious stuff. And a lot of it was uh, scripture memorization. They would do a lot of memorization in the scriptures. In fact, it's interesting in Psalm 1 where it says, Blessed is man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, but sits, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of God, and his law he meditates day and night. That's the first five books of Moses. And most Jews had the first five books of Moses memorized. And so this would probably be part of Paul's discipling with Timothy and Titus. They would have to memorize the first five books of Moses. So um, some of you might squirm if you're a disciple and say, I want you to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You might say, well, bye-bye. And uh, that's the end of that. So, But it is, it is a great reason, and we can see how Paul could entrust Timothy and Titus to all these churches he had started. Now, next Paul mentions a greeting here, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this is interesting because Paul uses this triad, grace, mercy, and peace, only in one other place. And that's his second epistle, Timothy, 2 Timothy. You know what Paul's greeting usually consists of? Grace and peace. That's it. Grace and peace. 
He mentions that Romans, 1 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 2 Thessalonians, Philemon. But here, grace, mercy, and peace. Now, we can only speculate as to why there's a triad here, but I can tell you as a pastor's wife, that pastoring churches requires a lot of mercy. And so, because it's a pastoral epistle, it may be why he adds the third greeting of mercy. To shepherd sheep necessitates a lot of mercy. And Paul knew that because he founded many churches. And he knew Timothy would need mercy as a pastor. He also begins his triad. So let's talk about this triad a little bit. He begins his triad with the greeting of grace. What is grace? Well, grace is in reference to God's free gift of salvation to depraved men and women like us. And ladies, Paul not, never got over the fact that God saved him, that he reached down and touched him on the road to Damascus and drew him to himself. I fear many of us have gotten over the fact that God saved us. And many of us in this room think we deserve salvation. But my friend, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. I hope we never get over the fact that God saved us. Secondly, Paul mentions mercy. And remember, this is different than his other epistles. Mercy, what is it? Mercy is that which is shown from one person to another, and it involves acts of pity towards someone who is in need. In fact, one man says it's an emotional response to a bad situation. Now today I was nursing my husband all day. He had, he had pretty extensive surgery yesterday, and I had to show a lot of mercy and all day long. I just kept saying, Susan, just do the next thing. Just be kind, just do the next thing. And uh, so it's, a, it's an emotional response to a bad situation and showing pity to someone who is in need. Now, I mentioned, as I mentioned, Timothy would need a lot of mercy in pastoring the church at Ephesus. Remember the church at Ephesus? Remember the seven churches at Asia? Remember what John says about the church at Ephesus? They lost their first love. They weren't cold, they weren't hot, they were lukewarm. And what did God say? I want to vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. So, how would you like to pastor a church like that? There's nothing more heartbreaking than to be in a church that isn't passionate about their relationship with Christ. And so, um, Timothy would need a lot of mercy. Now, peace is the third part of this greeting. Peace comes from knowing God. It's not emotional, it's a reality. Peace is a reality, it's a product of our salvation, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. And ladies, if you, in fact, yesterday, um, my husband's surgery was only supposed to last an hour, and two hours passed, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? This is like deja vu two years ago when he almost died. And, and uh, yesterday when we got home, my husband said to my son, so did your mother get anxious? And he said, no, mom, or no, dad, she didn't. And I was like, good, I passed that test. But, uh, you know, peace is not anything I can produce, right? But it comes from knowing God. It's that inner tranquility of the soul. Now, as a believer in Jesus of Christ, ladies, it's essential we have all three of these present in our life. Grace, mercy, and peace. But especially those in leadership need grace, mercy, and peace as they shepherd sheep. But notice, these three things come only from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As one man says, with these three terms, Paul greets Timothy and the church. Grace, God's ongoing forgiveness and enabling. Mercy, God's sympathy and concern. Peace, God's tranquility and stability within and among them as individuals and as a Christian community. Also very interesting, I don't know if you noticed this, just as Paul is a spiritual father to Timothy, his son, God is the father of his son, Jesus Christ. And all four are mentioned in the opening of this letter. So, who is the spiritual son from this verse, and what do we learn about him? Timothy is the spiritual son, and we learn he's genuine, and he's a believer. What do we learn about our Heavenly Father from this verse? We learn grace, mercy, and peace come from him. We learn that he is God our Father, and his son is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, as we close this first lesson tonight... This letter to a spiritual son from a spiritual father. Some questions that come to mind are these. Who are your spiritual mothers and what have you gleaned from them? Who are your spiritual daughters and what have you gleaned from them? If you were facing your final days, what things would you like to pass on to those you have poured your life into? What things would be most important to you to pass on to those you, to, to those you disciple? 
For the Apostle Paul, he wants to pass on to Timothy things that matter, things that have eternal value. In fact, when he comes to 2 Timothy one year before he dies, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you've heard from me pass on to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. For Paul, he wants to leave Timothy instructions for things that matter. Instead of warning him how to survive a natural disaster should one occur, he warns him how to survive false teachers and how to confront them. Instead of building Timothy's self-esteem, he writes about how humbling it is that God would choose any of us. Instead of exalting himself and all of his accomplishments as an apostle, he exalts and lifts up the King Eternal, the only wise God. Instead of writing political jargon on how corrupt our government is, he writes about our biblical responsibility to pray and give thanks for those in authority over us. Instead of writing how Timothy needs to get with the seeker-friendly church, he writes about the importance of the God-given role of males and females in the church. Instead of telling Timothy, just pick any warm male body for serving as elder or deacon, he gives specific guidelines for how to choose godly men for leadership. Instead of telling Timothy to make sure he follows the latest health fads, the diet trends, and the exercise fads so he can be in shape for the pastorate, he warns him of the danger of these types of trends, and he calls them doctrines of demons. Instead of encouraging Timothy to minimize his sin and give in to cultural change, he charges him to be an exemplary example and wage war against sin. Instead of encouraging him to put older people in nursing homes, he gives instructions as to what is to be done with the aged. Instead of telling him to make sure he climbs the success ladder in ministry, sends his resumes to the finest churches so he can live in luxury, he warns Timothy of the danger of riches and the love of money. Instead of telling Timothy he will never be happy unless he gets more and more material stuff, he lovingly tells him that food and clothes is really all he needs to be content. This and much more is written by a loving spiritual father to his true son in the faith in 1 Timothy. Paul genuinely loves his son, and he loves the churches that he started, especially the church at Ephesus. And he knew that Timothy would need these specific helps as he shepherds with the master, shepherding the sheep. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for First Timothy. I thank you for the richness of just these two verses. Lord, there's so much there and so much I wasn't even able to share with these ladies. Your word is so rich. It is truly the delight and the joy of our heart. And Father, I pray that as we come to this epistle, that we would come with um, eyes that are ready to see, ears ready to hear, and hearts that are pliable, because I know that some of the things that we'll be studying this year will go against every fiber of our being, and we won't like it. But I pray, Lord, that we will come under the authority of your word, and Lord, that we would realize these things are written for our good and for our admonition so that we might grow one step closer in maturity to Christ Jesus. I pray that you will help us to be faithful, and I pray that, um, Lord, we would just have a rich time this year as we study this great epistle. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.